to a brand new Marvel Crisis video. Uh, my name is Fernando Fuentes, and I'm here with Milton Figueroa. Um, what up, what up? <laughs> we are longtime uh, card gamers. We've played card games individually, well, myself, for more than 10 years, and Milton has actually played for more than 15 years plus. Um, he's also played an extensive amount of other board games, um, miniature games such as Hero Clips. And he's my main playtesting partner. Um, we Just so that you guys have um, sort of like a background on us, we've played uh, Marvel Crisis Protocol um, for around maybe two months now. Um, we have more than 100 hours um, plus on Tabletop Simulator, just um, basically as research. Um, for this tier list that we're about to provide to you all today. And we're pretty excited to do this. Um, we have a lot of um, interesting uh, uh, like opinions, um, different from maybe what's already um, established um, out there in the community. Um, so I hope that everybody enjoys what we're about to provide today. And you know, uh, Milton, do you have any words or do we just uh, jump right into it? No, let's, let's jump into it. Okay, so just so that you all know um, a little bit about how we're doing this, it's going to be, we're just going to go uh, from in order of appearance. So the first one would be Baron Zemo, for example, and we'll just place him um, where he belongs and then kind of sort of give a brief overview of what we feel about him, what our playtesting experience was like with him, so like any positives or negatives that we have depending on the character that we are on and uh mostly here um so you all know between milton and i uh we had a little bit of different opinions on certain pieces but for the most part since we are uh, a playtesting team of two we can come to a consensus on almost all the pieces where they belong very specifically um and just keep in mind that there is close to zero, if not zero bias on every single piece here. It's all for a very hyper-competitive environment and hopefully everybody will be able to get something out of this tier list. So let's just start with Baron Zemo. So Baron Zemo, um, I would say very easily slots into the A tier for me. Um, just as passive, free rolling uh, dice on offense and defense makes it um, so that your team is a little bit more durable. The opponent's team is a little less durable. Um, helps you win a lot of you know coin flip situations where you need that one extra dice just to get to the finish line. Maybe get a daze, get a KO, um, have your unit survive onto its next activation. Um, in this game, it's a lot about variance, and there's a lot of like blowout scenarios where. You know, it's difficult to come back because there's only six turns in the game. So Baron Zemo just, you know, keeping people alive and helping you get those extra punches in. Um, really that, ability, that ability is definitely the reason you play Baron Zemo, nothing else. Like, he has some other good abilities and decent attacks, but the reason you play him is the, the reroll the dice on defense and attack. Yeah, the energy, the energy sinking um, abilities that he has are not stellar. He only really has a charge on large movement, so that's kind of useful in certain situations. But really, his passive is the reason you use him, and uh, his also um, his affiliation. He's basically the go-to um, three uh, threat on Cabal, which makes him very, very useful in that sense. But definitely, his passive is what gets him there. Um, so he belongs in A tier. Um, very powerful and he's sort of like the baseline from where we're going for like moving forward so just to, so you guys have an idea of the balance between damage output to utility and how the tier list works so the next um character that we're going with um is black widow um milton and i have gone back and forth on black widow a lot simply because at first um I, at least uh, for myself, I believe that going for missions and objective play was 100% the only way to play the game. But Milton, being a lot more experienced in the world of miniature games, like, uh, has basically demonstrated to me that um, going for uh, days in KO teams and winning 
in, in that way, eliminating everybody on the map is a very viable strategy. It's like super easy to execute an entire opponent's team by turn three, turn four. So in that way, objective only on pieces like uh, Black Widow kind of like go down on the tier list a little bit. So I'd say uh, around B, probably. That's where she belongs. C. C. I say C. I don't, I'm not a big fan of the Duco's characters that are not a Rocket Raccoon because they can't, can't really kill characters that cost three or more. Okay, so in terms of in terms of her utility, you see her only as a way to activate uh, our next characters, like um, hero effect, and that's basically all she's good for, pretty much. And yeah, um, yeah, I, I guess I can agree with that. She she's just there to complete objectives, hold objectives. She can't really secure, so that's why I don't like, I don't like her that much. Okay, and yeah, obviously has almost no utility outside of her stagger an opponent, and that's not very reliable on its own, right? So, okay, we'll put her in C. And then, going up on the next um, character. So this was, um, kind of like my starter team was Avengers. And probably many, many people, you know, start the game out with the base set, and they're giving me the, the heroes of the villains. Um, Captain America was the first piece that I played with. And he, um, coming from a card game background, his energy reduction effect is actually, in my mind, was the most powerful, if not the second most powerful, um, hero ability, and definitely something that you could build an entire team around. Um, but the more and more that I played um, with him, that was kind of his only redeeming factor. He was just sort of like a meat shield, um, and not much past that. His throw, um, his automatic throw on his attack, third attack, I believe. Um, it yields results sometimes, but it's, you know, not very powerful for a 4 3 character. So, outside of his affiliation bonus, I don't think he really accomplishes anything um, too special. What, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, the, the, uh, the only combination that I found use, very useful has been Doctor Strange. <coughs> the, sure. the plus two dice on defense, everything else has been... Kind of mediocre. Right? Black Luster, yeah. Maybe, maybe not, Hawkeye also. We'll, we'll definitely sure. um, get to the higher points of synergy with Captain America, and there's definitely some characters that only operate at the level that they do because of Captain America. But that's more just the, the power level of those characters, I feel. Um, but Captain's affiliation bonus is definitely his redeeming factor, so we'll leave him in the around the B tier for now. Um, let's go to the next piece. The next piece is Captain Marvel. Where would you say that um, Captain Marvel belongs? Maybe we've we've had a little bit of a discussion about this character because we've used it minimally, um, but it does look promising um, because binary form it just makes her not invincible and also a very real threat when it comes to her rerolling dice attack because she just has a much greater dice pool, so she becomes a a, a lot larger of a threat, and she's range four, so she can you know, um, hold down an objective while shooting from afar. So definitely, I know I know that both of us are fans of um, shooting characters, range four, range five, around that sweet spot. So what do you think about her? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure about her. I think probably an end of the V tier okay. because I'm not I'm not sure if she's good or bad. To, to be honest, uh, it all depends on your on how reliably you can binary form. If you can binary form on her. On her healthy side, she should be good, but I don't know how she consistently can do that. How consistently you can pull that off? Okay, and we we were talking about um, before this tier list and in our playtesting, the the one team that I really, really, really sh feel she would excel in is a 19 point um, cabal team where you would have uh, the cabal shell, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, with Red Skull's um, affinity bonus, uh, affiliation bonus, and then. Um, obviously, her gaining uh, one energy from her own effect on um, the range four energy attack, and also the affiliation bonus could make her binary form a lot more often. And like you said, in the front side, which is the important part, having her binary form before she takes a big hit to knock her into the injured side, I think is the the key factor between her being extremely good or 
close to unplayable. So we'll leave her uh, in the B tier for now. Um, so Crossbones, uh, unfortunately, I am not a very huge fan of Crossbones. Um, neither is Milton, I can safely say. I have, I have nothing good to say about Crossbones. Yeah, and this is actually after... We, we actually gave him um, a lot of tries. We played him like maybe four games, five games, because um, the way that we saw it was basically he's on alternative um, three cost uh, unit that you can use in Cabal, and we wanted to use uh, him and like it, have like Cabal be like a cheaper affiliation bonus so that we can fit other pieces into the Cabal team, but um, what we ended up discovering is that he's very unreliable. His damage output um, costs way too much energy, and it's sort of if if you miss on the turn where he tries to go off um, with all his dice, it's almost impossible for him to have any other redeeming quality. And at the same time, he's not that tanky. His stats are very low, except for his melee defense, and his damage reduction is really taxing for for the other things that he does. So, all in all, he just doesn't have enough self sufficiency to make him strong. So. Yeah, yeah. He, doesn't have, he doesn't. He doesn't have the armor at all times. Also, yeah. If if you catch him, you know, in, in a situation where he doesn't have his armor available, it, it actually becomes extremely easy to kill him. Even when he has his armor, it can be underwhelming sometimes. And it, like I said, it taxes his ability to defend and attack all at the same time. So it just becomes really awkward to play him. And for as a three cost, definitely not what you want from a three cost, especially since we'll see some other um, pieces in the tier list that are also three cost that are just provides him more than he does. So he's unplayable. Um, a little overview, by the way, of how the the basically the S through D tier work. Um, D is essentially pieces that you would never see on the table. Like you would never have a very good reason to put them on the table other than you like that piece and you want to see them doing some action. Um, C tier is playable uh, in new situations, but there's better options in almost um, all events. Maybe they have like a crucial mission that they can fulfill, or they have like a really key synergy, like we'll see later with Groot, um, like protecting Rocket. Like They'll have some key synergy where, you know, they, they could see play on the table feasibly, but or, or like they complete an affiliation that's important or whatever. But for the most part, C is not powerful pieces that fulfill a role. B tier, um, reasonably self-sufficient characters that provide something extremely unique to the game and could even be bumped up to you know that like real piece tier, which is A and S. Um, you know pieces that actually contribute um, to to the entirety of the game state and can really make a difference on their own. But they're just at the cusp, but they don't really make it there. They're mo they work more on synergies with other um, either affiliations or pieces or cards, etc. So that's what B tier is. And then A tier, completely self-sufficient. Um, they don't require anything other than you know themselves on the table, and they can provide an immense amount without help from anybody else. And they tend to be a little bit more powerful than the average piece. Um, and then, obviously, S tier would be your broken tier. There's just nothing nothing um, bad about the piece could justify uh, one not playing them on their team. Um, there's very few S tier characters um, as a whole. Um, I think less than 10% of the game, maybe, maybe like less than 15% of the game is S tier, but definitely there's going to be a lot of, um, a good amount of broken pieces that we're going to, show you guys in just a second. But yeah, so a little bit more detail on what the tier list letters are supposed to represent. So um, with that said, Doc Ock, I would put him... I, I know that you are not a big fan of Doc Ock. I, I would say maybe he goes into the C tier. What do, what do you think? I don't I don't like him at all. I think he's unplayable, but you like him because he has the throw and the range 3 basic, but I would never put him in them on board. Right, so yeah, so like, men like Milton mentioned, a lot of the time he's very inconsistent. Um, his affiliation bonus provides nothing, just because as we'll see, um, that affiliation isn't very isn't very good. The spider foes, um, but the fact that he's one of the few characters that has a range three um, basic attack 
um, um, all, albeit a little bit weak. Um, kind of gives him a little bit of a redeeming factor, and also the fact that he has he's a three cost piece with a throw. It's unique in some way, albeit pretty expensive. Um, he's a little bit self sufficient with his passive um, gaining um, energy for himself. So all in all, there's better pieces for sure, but he's not completely the worst. Um, maybe if, if you were doing spider foes and, it ma and the affiliation mattered to you, he's definitely <laughs> in some way. But but yeah, like Milton said, um, very little going for him besides that. Um, his card is huh? his card is also uh, like kind of hard to use. Oh yeah, so that's another thing that we in play testing. Um, definitely we gave him a try. I believe um, two or three games, and <sighs> what we discovered is that. At first, we, we had this idea that his um, card, the one that he uses with the Green Goblin, would be uh, a very explosive card where you would take away um, tempo from the opponent, taking away the objectives, dealing some damage here and there. But we just ended up discovering it's very expensive, and these characters don't gain energy very quickly. And also, on top of that, it's very inconsistent. There's only a 33% chance of each dice. Um, applying to the effect, and that just makes it very, very unreliable in a game that takes you know, and everything has to be meaningful when you make a play, so just uh, nothing going for him in that sense. But yeah, um, I'm glad we went over it, the uh, that the card also, because cards do have a part to play in some of the, the characters' positions in the tier list, so we're going to see that in the future, like for example with uh, Ghost Rider, but for now, uh, let's do um, Iron Man. I, I know that um, Iron Man, from the very beginning, you were a huge fan of Iron Man, so I want you to explain this one in your words. Cause... I, just, I just like all the characters that have armor that prevent one damage to a minimum of one. So, yeah. There are all, the, all the characters that have that ability, to me, are at least playable because they can tank and they don't get one shot at easily. Okay, this makes sense. And also, so not only does he have armor, he has uh, four defense, which makes him very, very tanky against certain threats. Uh, he I think it's melee attacks. He defense. has something to do with his energy, um, the increased dice. It may be at a bad ratio, because um, it's only two dice for three um, energy, but at least he has something to do with his energy. And I know you're a big fan of his flip side, the uni beam um, ability. <laughs> Specifically in some missions like the shelters mission, so yeah, the uni beam's good in, on shelters. I'm not sure if it'd be good on any other on any other uh, the mission. The mission, which is kind of like shelters, it's almost the same. Yeah, but it doesn't force it doesn't force everybody to the middle. The shelter kind of force everybody to the middle. That's true. That's true. That's fair. So yeah, so basically, um, when there when there's fighting in a clustered position, he he can uh, control the points a little bit. Um, definitely output some chip damage and then just be that tank for three cost. His affiliation um, also not that bad. So you see, if you see your opponent has a lot of melee. If you see your opponent has a lot of melee characters, then he's he's gonna be great. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So we're gonna put him in the middle of B. Oh, also uh, another keynote as we keep adding uh, more characters to the tier list. Um, the order that you see will also. Um, be relevant, so we will put you know Captain America slightly better than um, Iron Man, slightly better than Captain Marvel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as we go along, you'll see that th there's definitely um, in our minds um, something to be said of a A plus tier versus S plus tier, you know, top of, top end of B versus back end of B definitely matters. Um, you'll see that as we flesh out the characters a little bit. So um, let's go. I would say better than Captain America, but in the same tier. Um, I know I know that that can be a little controversial simply because his affiliation bonus seems on the surface to be better. Um, it's definitely better, but um, Captain America, the reduction ability, it, they kind of generate the same amount of energy at the same rate, I would say. What do you feel? Uh, the reason the, the Red Skull is better is because he can generate energy for attacks. Captain America only generates energy for abilities. I actually, yeah, that that's well, it may that may seem um, a little bit simplistic in the surface, but it, it actually matters a lot in the context of the game because the game is played so much about 
um, attacking and you want to attack multiple times um, per turn. And also, uh, something to be said about attacks are definitely more powerful than defensive. Like, take, taking the offensive is normally better in this game, as we'll see with other characters, but he, he basically rewards a, a, a different pattern of play, and also his his uh, card, the uh, take, an extra, take an extra turn with the same character, uh, Invigoration, um, also significantly more powerful than most of the other cards in the game, so he gets that benefit, right? Yeah, also triggering triggering the, the Red Skull abilities a lot easier than the Captain ability. Agreed, agreed. No, yeah, exactly. Just e ease of ease of access to the affiliation bonus. Um, he, I mean, his attacks are nothing to laugh at, too. Uh, he, he's ranged, so he's, he's useful even if he stays at home. Um, in the case of, for example, shelters where you stay um, close to your side of the map with him and then you just shoot out some damage. Um, he, he gains energy, so he's very self-sufficient, um, albeit taking maybe one or two damage um, here and there, but for the most part, he, he already has high defenses for his own right, so he's hard to take down easily. So, I don't know, I feel like between his card, his his affiliation, and him not being shabby in his own right with his own attacks, um, definitely gets into that sweet spot where he's, I, I think he's in the top end of B tier, for sure. I agree. And he also has, he's also best friends with a card that we'll see very soon. Um, so, Spider-Man. <laughs> we'll, we'll say a few words about our friend Spider-Man. Peter Parker, unplayable. <laughs> yeah. So, um, basically, he could he could easily be the the worst piece in the game. I mean, at first you would think that he has some amount of utility because he has a throw, he has um, a decent a decent attack, he has the ability to defend himself for this two dice reroll. Um, he has an affiliation now, which you know makes him a little bit more useful. But no matter how many you know factors you throw in there, he's just not very self sufficient. Like he has to wait a very long time to be useful in any way, and then when he tries to be uh, said useful. He kind of falls flat compared to other four cost characters. So, ten HP for four for four thread. Yeah, there's characters um, that cost three that have more HP. <laughs> yeah, it's a little embarrassing in the HP front. Um, <laughs> that's a good way of saying it. Yeah, tankiness and damage output. Um, that's kind of like the formula in this game. Um, being able to survive attacks to then dish out your own attacks uh, is very important. If uh, like we're gonna see if you get one shot um, as a character, you you can't be glass cannon in this game. It's just not. It doesn't reward you to. You you might be able to kill, you know, some characters on your opponent's side, but even then, you'd really rather just have a bunch of tanks that uh, don't die. And I don't think Peter Parker does any of those, you know, well. So that's why he's one of the worst characters. Um, let's go with Ultron. Speaking of infinite tension where would you put ultron i know we've gone back and forth on his card being like the make or break point for him so what do you feel ultron, that is that is his best his best attribute his card which is which is why which is why he, he probably shouldn't go on d maybe he goes on c but i have him on d because he he's not very good for four for four threat yeah, so you're going to see a recurring pattern, um, how we've been saying, you know, for four cost, um, so the, the three cost characters are so good in this game, that four cost has to have some game-breaking uniqueness to it that the three costs don't provide, and just, honestly, not a lot of four costs, um, you're, you're going to see that not a lot of four costs are toward the top of the tier list, so he goes in the C tier, uh, if nothing else, because of his Cabal affiliation and his card, making him very very tanky but otherwise i i just don't think he has any redeeming factors so, the line you have to, with, you have to um, kill him twice technically you have to kill him twice but he's not much of a threat you probably like deal with other things on on his team before you get to him yeah what's to say the opponent doesn't just ignore him right he doesn't provide that greater threat where you actually have to deal with him. Plus, his size is a pretty big problem. He can get thrown at his allies, and he just becomes more of a detriment than 
a boon. So now here, here comes one of your favorite pieces. I know definitely at first you wanted to make every single different team that you could with with uh, the Hulk. So how do you feel? Then, yeah. then he got one shot at every single game. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of funny story. Every single time that either Milton or I would play the Hulk, because we're we're actually both very big fans of the Hulk, it's uh, didn't turn out too well. Yeah, he he would take an attack, you know, take his turn, maybe get maybe get one or two extra dice on his attacks, you know, maybe he would KO an opponent's piece at best, and then then he would just sit there and take you know 15 damage in a single activation from some of the S tier characters, and then. Yeah. The you first time I played him, the first time I played him, he had five five wounds, and my opponent activated his Valkyrie and he died. And then the second time I played it, I played him, he had eight wounds, and my opponent activated his Corvius Glaives and he died. And then <laughs> I decided to stop playing the Hulk. <laughs> not a very not a very good showing. Uh, uh, so let's just talk about why. So no matter no matter how many redeeming factors you can have on a character. If they have such a low defense value as two, like they they have to be close to unplayable. It's just like we said before, tankiness is what matters uh, a significant amount in this game. To be able to fulfill objectives, to be able to take a hit and then uh, deliver one back. Um, yeah, it's just not. He do, he has gamma launch, so he's useful for for something. Oh yeah, the 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 <laughs> basic point to having him not in the D tier is gamma launch. As actually, in fact. Gamma Lounge is so powerful that he's actually going to be in the higher end of the C tier. I would say maybe right behind Romanov, but if it wasn't for his card, he wouldn't be worth much of anything. So he just have not set up the first, the beginning, the first turn with Gamma Lounge is really powerful. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so we finally got to our first S tier character. Um, there wasn't much debate about this one. Um, after the first few times that both Milton and I played Modok, um, we were convinced. And it's the the, the math on his the, the way that math works on his dice. If you want to go a little bit more into detail on that, or more or more to say, his opponent the opponents attacking him's dice. Yeah, exactly. So every time uh, an opponent attacks Modok, I think I think we said it was only a thirty three percent chance of them actually landing a hit. As opposed to the regular fifty percent, so that makes him infinitely more tanky than it would seem at first, just on just on face value, because he has low defense dice, same as the Hulk, right? But um, yeah. it's the fact that it's the fact that he, the opponents only have thirty two percent of the sides of, it, of their dice, you know. Um, the only thing that uh, could be a weakness for him is collision damage, but almost every character in the game dies to collision damage. Like it's just a broken mechanic that. You know, there's no there's no real way to play around it or fix it besides brace for impact. But every character has that weakness, so it you know it's just another thing that Modok deals with. But he, even then, he has like you mentioned before, 10 HP on the front side, so he's always healthy. He can be revived and then healed to full. Uh, we had a game in particular where I think I think one of uh, each of us did it at least once in our games where. He would um, get knocked out. Even if he was knocked out from, like, let's say, 7 HP and he would be knocked down to 0, we would field dressing and then mid kick and then uh, patch up. And just like that, he would go from 0 HP to 2 H to, uh, like, 8 HP. And you would have just have to deal with Modok's front side all over again. And it's very, very difficult to get, you know, destroyed uh, consistently like that. So I just feel he's a huge tank. And he also outputs... Uh, pretty decent amount of damage considering his damage output is blue and blue attacks you know as we've seen with other characters are not not very well defended against so and he can throw in the S tier. So he, can, he can have he can damage the, he can use a damage source three times with two attacks and the throw and the, and the throw ability oh yeah exactly so so he has two instances of damage which is in range four and then of course, he has the AOE attack, which can hit multiple units, and then he also has his throw, which can do collision damage, as we said, which obviously just a, just an all-around really strong piece. Um, contesting objective is, you know, laughably easy when you have Modoc on your team. So, um, yeah, and the affiliation bonus to give Red Skull 
you know, his affiliation bonus. Just all around one of the best pieces in the game. He's S tier. Well, Red Skull, Red Skull's the reason that you can easily field dress and patch up back up to a healthy, oh, yeah, great healthy. synergy with the with the healing cards. Definitely one of the main reasons why energy um, energy production is so powerful in that way. And his card, his card to move a unit is also very powerful. Oh, let's not let's not forget that. Yes. Yeah, so in the same way that um, Red Skull has the take an extra turn card. Modok has a um, essentially like a movement, uh, a blink card, basically for anybody uh, to take their own speed. So on large pieces, is that it actually becomes a really powerful combo. Like we're gonna see with, with another piece like Gamora later on. It's like it's their movement. It's not you know just a, a teleportation. Um, you know teleport for two. It's not something as simple as that. It's their movement. So like move medium, move large. Uh, when you synergize with characters like that, it becomes really really powerful. So. Definitely another. See, just you just can keep adding to the list of benefits that Modar gives you. It's just a crazy strong piece. Let's keep moving on to um, Black Panther. What do you feel about our our friend here, Blackie P? I was a huge fan of his at the beginning before we started playing, but now I'm kind of I kind of have him on the B on the B tier. Okay. Bro, in front so of Iron. he didn't go down that much in your esteem, but what, what yeah. do you feel his detriments were, or like his shortcomings? It's, it's just the his uh, his uh, I liked him because he, to me he was tanky, but not not to blue attacks. He his his weakness to blue attacks was what make me uh like not put him down. Really, a you consider whether you, whether you wanted to play him or not? Right? Yeah, okay. but he's great against against energy and melee. He's great. Yeah, so if the opponent doesn't really um, have a way to abuse uh, blue attacks, uh, Black Panther is a pretty strong consideration in th in those scenarios. But for the most part, yeah, that shortcoming that he can't really defend, he's kind of like paper against blue attacks. And um, aside from that, I think the, the best part about him is Mantle of the Black Panther, the one where you can reroll um, the dice. We discovered like in one of our games that the dice rerolling is during the entirety of the turn, so you only activate that once, but both of its attacks um, gain the benefit. So I think that's a pretty big deal um, from the playtesting that we did. Like he's he's a very consistent piece in the damage output department. So um, one thing that I will note, though, the, I, I some people might consider it a benefit. I consider it kind of a weakness. Whenever he attacks, he pushes. He he does a mandatory push, small. Sometimes that can kind of mess up your ranges, right? So when you, whenever you want to do continuous attacks, it's kind of difficult. Um, but sometimes, obviously, you can control points with that. So it's a give and take in that sense. He's more of an objective-based piece in that way. Um, he has three, three damage outputs per turn with his throwing himself ability. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, definitely in the category of three damage instances. Um, you're going to see us repeat that a lot um characters with throws characters any any form of ability that lets the character um attack a third time essentially during a turn or more um makes them much higher on the tier list because damage output is really significant in this game so or, or not even damage output i should say um chances of rolling the dice um if nothing else so let's go to um, chances of dealing damage what's up Chances of dealing damage. Exactly, just giving yourself the amount, like that many more chances to deal damage is what matters. So, we went a little bit back and forth with Killmonger. I, I, I know you're a big fan of his card uh, specifically, but he himself yeah. might have a little bit of a lacking like kit. So, how do you? Yeah. Feel about? I don't. I, I like his card, but I don't like the his, the character. Okay, that makes sense. Um, his card, obviously, you know, when you kill someone that is the highest cost, uh, the highest threat, you gain two VP. Obviously, we've seen that VP uh, gain is very, very crucial. So, yeah, you can get you can get basically the same or better for less threat. I agree. I think I think some characters are a lot more aggressive, a lot less. Uh, risky in the sense that sometimes the card that Killmonger has, first of all, it takes up a card. Cards in this game we've seen are very powerful, so you don't want to just use up a card like that for a win condition. That might be win more sometimes. Um, arguably, if you're killing a piece, you're probably already winning in that sense, right? And then other times it might be impossible to kill the opponent's highest cost piece. I mean, 
in theory, the highest cost piece is probably the one that the opponent wants to keep alive the longest. So that's kind of like a conflicting, you know, game plan. So in that way, uh, where, where does he go? I, I think he goes C tier, right? Yeah. C tier, yeah. I think I think a, a little bit higher in the C tier, but definitely we'll leave him like right in the middle. So where do you, where do you, did you ever decide where do you finally want Okoye? I'll let you decide. Okoye, Okoye, I would put her in like probably B or C. B or C? Okay. B, B. I'll put her... You know what? I'll do this. I'll put her around Romanov. I would say high C. Do you want to go in a little bit more into detail about we, what we discovered about uh, two-cost characters um, and how they kind of work within the game? Like, Well, gener generally, they really... they if on Only Rocket can kill characters. They can kill other twos, but they can't really kill threes. Yeah, threes are higher, become a lot more difficult so, to kill. So whatever their utility is, is what you is what you use them for. So in Okoye's case, is is the bodyguard. So you use her for bodyguard, and then you can take cheap shots with her range four attack. Yeah, but it's kind of like inconsistent damage. You really use it for the bodyguard ability, like you're saying. Um, yeah. But I feel like I feel like honestly, the only consideration I would have to putting her in low B tier. Uh, would be that bodyguard is a very unique ability and having it on a two cost piece means that you can save your four and five cost pieces at least from multiple like two attacks at, at most or, or at least and sometimes three attacks because she's inherently tanky you know what i mean um but that would be the yeah. really redeeming factor yeah. right, um we'll just leave her there for now i think the the highest in c tier would be fine i don't think she's that bad um, so a character that at first glance, you actually didn't like this character at the beginning. So can we talk about a little bit about Shuri and how, how she changed in your mind? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like Shuri because I was trying to play teams on for that ignored winning by points. And I was just trying to like kill my opponent's team always, but I discovered that that wasn't like as easy as, as it looked. The games, too, as the games are too quick, six turns or the go by super quick and your opponent can run so it may not may not be uh you may not be able to uh, always to win, win through by combat. always win by killing your opponent so you need uh you need some like some people to help you like f fulfill the objectives and and uh sure he does that by pushing off by pushing off of a uh, of secure secure points okay yeah, that makes sense. And also, I, I would say just a quick note on like how we've been playtesting and discovered so far. So, the the teams that try to like eliminate the opponent's uh, pieces, uh, more than anything, what we end up doing is just gaining a lot of points, like a burst of points at the end of the turn, because anything that's dazed or KO'd can't contribute to the point gaining. So it just ends up being that the game is so short that the person who's KOing the enemy's pieces just ends up winning by VP anyway, right? That that's what we've kind of like seen. Unless you unless you build a team that is 100% uh, centered on winning by points, which is completely possible too. But for the most part, when you when you do a kill team, they end up winning by VP also, which is kind of like counterintuitive. But you know, different different pieces are. Uh, you know, built for different purposes, and Shuri is definitely there for the point gaining aspect. The reroll ability is, is really strong too for either for either type of strategy. So, oh yeah, could you mention at one time? I remember you specifically said um, something that was very key. She doesn't output her damage uh, with her attacks. Obviously, she outputs her damage with a rerolling. If you want to go more in depth on that, so what I what I said was uh, that she doesn't do damage with her die. I mean, sorry, she doesn't do damage with her attack. She, do oh, sorry, no, no. What I, what I said was she gives her dice to other people instead of using them herself. Exactly. So, yeah, no. So that's a, that was a really good way of putting it. It's like she may not have the dice output, but she gives multiple rerolls to the allies, and the allies are the ones that might have that throw um, effect on the auto attack, or might have you know other CC like uh control abilities on their auto attacks and so by doing that she she is actually outputting damage it's just uh not through her own self but through her allies so definitely an extremely powerful piece obviously re-rolling dice as we can see there's kind of like a common a common uh 
theme that you're noticing in the S and A tier, every character rerolls dice um, in those tiers. Um, that's why it's just so powerful to manipulate dice and variants. Um, especially in a game like this where you can get blown out and never recover because there's only six turns in the game. So, um, Venom. Uh, I know one of the community's favorite pieces, but we have it kind of a lot lower on the on the scale. Do you want to go in, into that a little bit? He, he has a glass duo against energy. He only rolls two dice against energy attacks. Yeah, like we've seen, that's very weak. <laughs> the, the same reason we don't like the Hulk. Because he has Glacio, so even though he has, that might also be a, a proponent, I guess, of us playing some very powerful energy attack pieces, which we're gonna get into later. We've mentioned Rocket already, but there's also um, one more piece, a couple of more pieces actually, maybe like two or three more pieces that only attack energy most of the time, and I think that really puts down um, Venom in terms of the power level. Because if everybody attacked melee, Venom would be extremely powerful, but that's not really the a realistic case. So, um, yeah, glass jaw against energy is a significant problem. So, we, we just have him very very low in the tier. Um, do you want to talk about his card, Lethal Protector? Lethal Protector is just basically a, a bodyguard, a one-time bodyguard. Right. So, so he becomes a one-time bodyguard, and he has that little bit of a blink ability where he can reposition himself, but it's not too too drastic of a of a utility, I suppose. Utility. So. Yeah, it's, you're better off having actual bodyguards that you can use multiple times so. without having to use a card slot. Agreed. Yeah, like we said before, the card slot is very powerful. So uh, a piece that we've used a little bit less, I think, but um, we kind of like have seen the potential in it. But it, she's more of a really strictly support piece. And like we've said before, support pieces should only cost two. Um, this support piece in particular costs three. So where do we put uh, Gwen in the power ranking? Gwen, Gwen, I don't have a lot of experience with her. I, I feel like she uh, she is only good in trying to like fulfill, fulfill, uh, objectives, only? fulfill objectives. Yeah. I got you. By um, pulling a... Uh, I know that, I know that you, in in some of our games, actually, toward the middle of playtesting, maybe like forty hours into playtesting, you were a big fan of um, her 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 uh, effect. It actually, comes in a card. Um, I don't remember the name of the card right now, but it's basically her um, saving an allies effect. Uh, there's a card for it, and you used to play that card a lot. So, do you value repositioning very highly in this game, or how do you feel about that? Uh, no, that was that was a period that I was just trying out the card because I like to like try out everything that I, that I feel could be useful. But in the end, it wasn't it wasn't as strong as the other cards that we normally play, like yeah. Med Pack, Match Up, All You've Got, Field Dressing. It's hard it's hard to beat those four cards. Yeah, so so let's just go into that a little bit because we don't we don't really have a tier list for the cards themselves. Um, but there are four cards that are almost um. Irreplaceable staples, and I learned this the hard way. <laughs> it's uh, uh, medkit, um, patch up, uh, all you've got, and field dressing. So those are irreplaceable. You know, four out of the five slots for any deck. Um, you really can't play without them. I would say, right? You gotta have a really good reason to not play one of those. Yeah, you you would have to have a very good reason. So, um. In that way, she gives you kind of like a card every single you know time that you, your allies get attacked. But you need to position her. She has to be in a position um, already where she that that would be useful. Um, sometimes terrain gets in the way of that. Sometimes the mission doesn't really demand that you do that. Other times you kind of want just someone else fulfilling the role of of a three threat. Um, you know, doing what she does. So, um, gaining energy uh, on range attacks, powerful like we've seen. Uh, but just not not great overall for uh, three threats. So where where did we put her um, originally? I, th I think C tier or bottom of B or C. C tier. C tier. It was C. Yeah, for sure C. So we'll just leave her there. Um, well, probably better than the Hulk. Worse than Romanov. Um, so this is a, a very interesting piece. So very recent, like... 
an upset, you could say. Um, I had very low regard for uh, Miles Morales at first, but after reading the card, you know, doing a little bit of the math on it, and then also playtesting maybe like three games, four games, I know that you're still down a little bit on the card, but I have it very high on tier list. I actually have it at the very bottom of A tier. Um, let's just go into this card a little bit because I feel like he's so unique in what he provides. Uh, I, I think I think he's good as a team leader. If you're playing the Spider Friends, you give every, you can give everybody an extra die on defense. But uh, every, other than that, he's 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 average. I would put him in the B in, on the B tier. Right. So yeah, I know for sure you you have him in the B tier. Um, the reason why I have him so highly is because. Um, well, besides the obvious, I think that the most powerful part about him is that in his auto attack, he has swirly throw, but it's not uh, any generic throw um, because a lot of characters have that. It's a range three uh, auto attack that has a three or lower throw, which essentially nets you um, four direct damage uh, when you when you you know land the, the swirl effect, uh, the wild. But, uh, I know that I know that your counter argument is that it's inconsistent in the way yeah, that he the auto uh, the auto attack means the zero cost attacks. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If we didn't mention that, auto attacks just mean the the zero cost attack or the attack um, that gains the the character energy in some way, or or the most common attack that that character does, and then in that way, energy sinking attack would be the one that costs a lot of energy. The three cost attacks, the four cost attacks. So just a little bit of a, a terminology. Um, for everybody, but I know that you don't like the wild um, throw on him because his basic attack is only four dice. I know that that's pretty inconsistent to land the wild. So I think I don't think I think it's just not. I just don't think it's special. It's not. It's not powerful. Like his strength. His strength is giving everybody a dice, an extra die on defense. Right. So it's fair, uh, fair to say that you would never play him outside of his affiliation. Okay. Um, yeah. I yeah. think uh, in Correct. that way, uh, you might convince me, honestly, just to put him in the top of B tier. And also, if we're being honest, all the affiliation cards so far are in the top of B tier. So we'll just leave him there with everybody else. Um, if we put him down here, I'll, I'll put him as the best one down here for now. Just because I think he's useful outside of the affiliation. But we'll keep going from there. Um... I'll just go right ahead and throw this guy in there. Around, I would say here. What do you think about that? I would put him ahead of, of Miles. Yeah. For sure. So right here. So I, um, at first, considered Thor good for different reasons than what you consider Thor good. So what what do you want to go into Thor like specifically? How how do you, well, you use uh, him? He, he, he might be he might be a he might be a also probably probably more a than b. But we can leave him there if you want. I like I like him because he has five range and it and and shock five range attack and shock for one mana and he can do it twice per turn because he has a guardian. Right. Yeah. So he can consistently do his uh, range five attack. Um, we're huge fans of, you know, shooters, range 5 attack or um, range 4 attacks, and it, it's definitely easy to pay for um, because of his Asgardian, and that's not exactly, you know, the conventional way of playing Thor. So how do you feel How do you feel that the automatic shock on a range attack, you know, plays into Thor's strength? Like, why do you, you use him like that over using him as a charger? For example, I, I don't like I don't like going into the melee with him because he doesn't have armor and he has only five HP. Even though he has four dice on, I think it's all four of his defenses. I mean, all three of his defenses. I oh, know. So he oh, has a, so I, he has four and four and three. So he's weak uh, in the blue defense department, but he does have six HP. I think six and eight. Six, six and eight. Yeah. So he he takes full like he doesn't since he doesn't have armor. And most like, takes only two attacks, right? Yeah. If he goes, if he goes, is he charged in? He's he's gonna die eventually. He's gonna die. So I'd rather keep him at range. Yeah, because you, you can always you can always wait until they go into you and then use his charge. His charge doesn't have to be. It can be like a counter punch almost. 
Right, right. Or not even at all. Just just keep using the hammer if they're they're still far. If they go within two, then you can start doing the the melee attack. But I would not. I would rather. I would rather just use my energy to shock their whole team. Yeah, shocking. Obviously, um, would you say the second most powerful, uh, like uh, crowd control ability uh, after stagger? I think yeah, so. stagger is the is the best one, and then shock is obviously. Not obviously, but in my opinion, after after stagger is the best status condition. Yeah, at least the most accessible one. That's also incredibly powerful because removing a dice from the pool, uh, the, unquestionably very powerful. So we'll leave in, we'll leave it on the top of B tier for now, uh, just because, like we said with Miles, um, all the affiliation characters are there. Um, but definitely, he's in the conversation for A tier. Um, and now we go to our second S tier character, which is also an Asgardian. So, talk a little bit about Valkyrie. Well, Bar- Valkyrie is the strongest, the strongest three. She has the yeah by far, the, by far. The attack, that get, the attack with flurry, and uh, just with that alone, this is good enough for me. Their their damage output is extremely high, very strong. Yeah. So. At first, um, uh, you know, at face she, value, has throw, she has the throw on top of that. She has the flurry and the throw. Yeah, so she can she can output almost uh, four or five damage instances uh, during the course of a turn for a three cost card. That's obviously absurd. So that's why she's in the S tier. Uh, but more than that, she she per, she she provides something uh, to do with energy, which I think. Um, some three cost pieces uh, don't do in the same way in the same way that uh, Shuri uses her energy very efficiently um, Valkyrie uses all her energy very efficiently um, the only difference I would say is that Valkyrie needs uh, to do like a combo turn where she uses all of her abilities in one turn uses her you know charge to go in from a safe distance into the into the melee battlefield then she do, does War of Legend in combination with Dragon Fan, so that's seven energy, right? But that seven energy combination, I think almost, you know, if, if not something catastrophic happens, it's gonna net you a kill almost always, right? It's a very strong attack. You should you always deal a lot of damage with it. You know, it, it's very 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 easy to deal. You know, from five to seven damage with just that combination and if you i know something very important uh, that was key you mentioned uh very early in the playtesting actually it was if you get to do her combo um on her front side it's almost impossible for the opponent to come back because her combo on the fl- is going to happen at least one more time on the flip side also so once on the front side once on the flip side and i know that um uh, field dressing like helps in doing that too it, it, just in case she get burst she gets burst down but she's not even that squishy she has three across the board and six hp so it's not even that easy to kill her on the front side right so yeah she's a, she is extremely powerful for a three cost everything you want and obviously with the throw on top so uh one quick note that we'll say also the reason she belongs in the s tier she has a uh, very powerful interactions against modok because she can actually consistently deal him damage, whereas other pieces can't. So just a little quick note on that. She's actually one of the better options against Mona. Um, oh, so we have all the Asgardians in a row. So we can actually do both of these at the same time. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a limb and say that they belong down here. I, I agree. I've, I've, I've actually never seen or played against uh, her. But I played against uh, Loki, and he wasn't very special. So, can we talk a little bit about, I guess, their weaknesses? Because we, uh, I, I think these characters might be popular in the community, so we, we just want to go into why in like a really. There's, I think they're they're just too expensive for what they do. If they if, if they both cost one less, then they might be playable. So, in a hyper competitive environment. What sets apart the top tier pieces from the bottom tier pieces is their uniqueness, I suppose. That's one way of saying it. And while Loki might be unique in some of his abilities, um, it's kind of difficult to justify his four um, threat level when he deals such low um, damage output. Um, His crowd control is kind of like a little meh, sort of unreliable. I believe he only puts slow on people, if I'm not mistaken. 
and then also it's almost impossible to uh, land his mesmerize I think it's called or no, whatever the attack is called that needs two wilds in order to trigger so for for kind of like a very low amount of payoff so all in all he's just too expensive for what he does and the gems don't really help him out that much honestly because he's not very self-sufficient to begin with so gems don't really you know push him up the tier in any way um we'll put him we'll put him at the top of d tier just because you know they're as guardian that's i think that's the one thing that they, they do um they gain two energy per turn um they can play cards they can play cards yeah <laughs> that makes them slightly useful but i feel i feel more than that um i think for loki actually so loki i would say I would put maybe at the very bottom of C, and the only reason I would do that is because of his um, passive, where he makes things more expensive. I could see a world where, in a very niche scenario, um, if you're going against maybe five or six uh, character teams, um, it's kind of like go wide strategies. He could really shut down some of the the, you know, effects um, from multiple pieces because he he would make it very expensive for the opponent to play. But that, I just don't think that the game, you know, works very well in that favor. So, I'll put. I only, see him, I only see him being helpful against against a Captain America, Avengers team. Yeah, against the Avengers, I think he would be decent. And even then, I, I think that the Avengers are so cost efficient that he probably would make little to no difference, honestly. Um, but yeah, so he's niche. So we'll put him in the C tier just by definition. And Hello. No redeeming factors. I think I think it's so difficult to ramp up with Hella that she doesn't provide anything. Oh, and do you want to mention actually, kind of like a little bit amusing uh, when it comes to Hella, how like small her HP pool is. If you want to. Oh yeah, that she has she has less HP than 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 uh. Three costs. Most of the three costs have more HP than she. Does. <laughs> yeah. And no armor. And no armor too. So. That's embarrassing. She has more. <laughs> she has one more. One more HP than Nebula. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, just I don't know. Very diff- so. What what we what we mean when we say um, difficult to ramp up or not self sufficient enough? Um, I guess we should explain that. It's basically saying their attacks are not um, easy to execute. Um, you know, the, her strike is range two, so she has to be melee range with how squishy she is. It's very difficult to actually accomplish that. It's unreliable to gain energy through attacks because they can get defended against, or you can just low roll and not gain any energy from the attack. Um, also, it's not even that strong of a melee attack. And at the same time, her range attack, which is the only, the, the, the blue range attack, which um, is pretty unique in that way, um, uses up all her energy gain for the turn so she can only do it once consistently right um and it's kind of like a generic six dice attack it doesn't do much of anything um so yeah she's just down there let's go for vision um at first you weren't that high on vision uh but i think he made it into like a few teams and was a little bit more powerful so where, where do you want to put vision Vision goes into the, in the V tier. Okay. I would put him. Middle, maybe better than these two. And the, better than. These uh, better than better than Captain Marvel probably. Uh, probably I, I think I like Iron Man better, but we can leave. Well, we can come. Like armor, armor is always just very useful. Um, he, Iron Man. I mean, sorry, Vision is 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 tanky, but only against two against against melee and energy. Right. And not, not only that, if it's not in the Avengers affiliation, it's very difficult to pay for that consistently, right? So, I would, right. Say, I would say the one thing that makes him very powerful... Um, actually, you, you know, I am going to put him a little bit higher than Iron Man. And the reason for it is because his uh, throw, his throw is very, very strong and only as a two-cost throw. So, he does have three damage instances, and I feel like that makes him... You know, okay. in the conversation for powerful, right? So, yeah, yeah. but he, he definitely only belongs in the Avengers, I think. 
Yeah, no, you definitely only play him in Avengers because of his uh, transformation ability. Alright. Okay, not much, not much else to say about him. He's pretty. He's a pretty generic character. Just kind of like fulfills a role in certain teams, um, and that's about all he does. He's a four cost for the Avengers. That's basically what he's there for. Um, argue like these two are interchangeable for the sake of their roles in the Captain America teams. Um, but I would say he's he's a little bit more powerful. Um, in those roles, but overall, I think Black Panther's stronger, so we'll just leave him like that. Can we talk about your boy? This was this was your day one favorite guy. So what happened to our friend over here, Winter Soldier? Winter Soldier, he was. I'm, I'm just. I just liked him because he had five range, but but uh, his strength. His only real strength is. His being any team ability and being able to fill out to finish a team ability for for team for teams that had to have too many crappy characters, yeah, so, or, too, or so, too expensive characters, basically. Yeah. Right. So some affiliations they they can only be filled out with expensive characters. Cabal is actually a huge proponent in this. Um, you wouldn't mind playing uh, Modok in every single Cabal team, um, but in theory, just you know, throwing it out there, four cost plus three cost is seven, and then the lowest that a Cabal affiliation can be is 12, so you really only have wiggle room for one extra piece in that combination. If you really wanted to, you could play Cabal with Winter Soldier and then have access to, uh, you know, two pieces sometimes. So he has that kind of utility, um, and, you know, Cabal is well, the only example. That was kind of a bad example. The, the a better example would be teams that only have one three cost character, like like Asgardian. You could play you could play Thor, him, and and Valkyrie, and leave you four points for for what for whatever else you want. I suppose if you play all all Asgardian characters, you only have three points after that. Yeah. So in that way, in that way, you would say that the the for example, you to, the only way to play a team with three Asgardians would be to play someone like Loki. And seeing as we don't want to do that, Winter Soldier could fit right in. Yeah, he's cheaper. Exactly. It's like yeah. close to. He has five range, and and it's cheaper. And he even though he only rolls four dice, then you can you can partner them up with somebody that costs four instead of somebody that costs three. Yeah, uh, that's a much better example, um, and that's good to bring up too. Is the fact that he might have low dice, but he's really there just for chip damage, so and point holding, obviously. So, yeah, but he's in the lowest uh, part of C tier just because he literally doesn't afford anything more than you know his affiliation, but it's uh, contributing affiliation to other teams. Um, so here we are, uh, the first. Arguably best or second best character in the entire game, so let's move him up right here. So I know that you have the most experience with this character. Um, what do you have to say? Uh, I like him a lot because I think he has the biggest the biggest damage output with uh, his death blow. I think it's called his four yeah, mana yeah. that flurries. The same reason that we have uh, Valkyrie in S tier. But his is more powerful because you can pair him up with the reality gem and hit harder. Okay. No, yeah, that makes sense. So let's just and go he that. Also has, he also has 6 HP with armor, which I'm a huge fan of. I already yeah. mentioned, huge fan of armor. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So being innately tanky and also having high HP and also having arguably the highest damage output in the entire game uh, with the reality gem. Um, I don't know, just kind of like a house. The, the, there's nothing bad about that character. Um, at first, actually, I guess um, through the playtesting process, I thought that he was immobile um, in the sense that he would have to go up there uh, using regular move um, and then you know fight like that, and that would kind of like that. It was kind of like detrimental for him because it's difficult to get him into the action. So a, a piece that only attacks getting into the action, you know, why, why would that be useful? But I learned that it's very easy to give him energy. Um, he gains energy pretty reliably through his own effects. Um, affiliation bonuses can help with that too. And then 
his range for a uh, death blow, like you were saying before, it actually gives him a blink ability, a blink medium. So he he actually moves around the battlefield with insane ease. Like it's super easy to just go kill two to three characters for turn with him. And um, yeah, it's just that's the one thing that that's the one check mark that I didn't you know I didn't under understand about him at first, and now that I do, I I know that he's crazy powerful. And just because we mentioned that. Um, I think that Fury, the the um, wild effect that lets you use a basic attack, um, that's probably the most powerful of the of the swirl effects. Um, except for maybe throw, maybe throw is the only thing that's comparable. But how do you feel about that? That is definitely why he's the most broken character. That in combination with Reality Gem, is, it stacks up a lot of damage. He can attack up to four times in one turn, and uh, basically to anybody on the team because he he can move medium in between attacks. Yeah, and just speaking a little bit about his energy generation, uh, when he does his basic, he gains energy from that, and it has piercing, so it's kind of reliable to gain at least one or two with that and combination with reality. So, just all in all, he's he's broken. Yeah. Just with the gem, you can do your your death blow on turn on turn two. So uh, he's great. He's great. Yeah, he's broken for sure. So um, he is only second, if that, to one other character, and we'll get to him soon. But for now, we're gonna go to his wife, which is Proxima. <laughs> his sister. Proxima? No, oh, I don't a, know. Sure. Is a in the card? It says like wife of. Uh, Corvius, I think. And oh, like, okay. okay. Corvius is like husband. I thought they were brothers. But yeah, same, same difference. So, like, <laughs> where did you put her? A, B? I, I believe she was in B, but I have no problem with putting her in A because she has armor and moves large. And if you pair her up with, uh, with Corvius, you can still initiatives. Oh yeah, so can we talk a little bit about the initiative stealing? Because I know you did that to me a lot when you played them both in combination. Yeah, if you if you move them if, if you move them both if you move them both with their ability, then you you steal the initiative from your opponent. Right. So if you and you always went first with Proxima. I do. I did note that. That's the best way to do that. Yeah, because they they just have to end up within four four of each other it's much easier with her this you want to be do, you want to be doing attacks with the corvius so yeah you just stealing, wanna... pri stealing the priority token having large movement uh, reasonable hp and uh yeah armor just another recurring theme in the tier list so we're gonna put her, her in the bottom of a tier i think she deserves it honestly especially with her synergies with corvus um so <clears throat> Where does Gamora land? I know that I know that I had to use her a couple of times for you to kind of like grow a little warmer to her. Like, where would you put her in the tier list? I would put her still still on C, but but she was on D before that, so. <laughs> so I did my job at least. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put her we'll put her in the C tier. I'll put her in the high uh, end of the C tier just because she's one of the more viable um, four cost characters. So, I feel she provides... She's actually the quintessential uh, glass cannon character. There is no other glass cannon character quite like her in the sense that she will, with absolutely no doubt, um, like end up killing two to three of the opponent's pieces, at least uh, dazing them, maybe killing them. But she's going to die before turn three, almost consistently, from the, the times that we played, right? And the only time that she ever survived to turn three was... When by turn three I mean turn three getting to attack a second time right uh, was when I high rolled on her defensive rolls and then she obviously went to town in that game but for the most part she gets two shot and that's all she wrote right by anybody she has uh, I believe it's like five HP on each side yeah so it's just so easy to kill her um, very difficult to resolve her her martial prowess. Um, the opponent can play around it pretty easily. She gets displaced. Um, her redeeming factor is that she's large, so she can get, you know, anywhere in the battlefield and like. She moves large. Yeah. 
yeah so she can get anywhere on the battlefield but uh kind of a glass jaw so don't really like her too much but you know she goes to town when she has the opportunity um and her sister where do you want to put nebula nebula i can i would put her on b b tier oh really because b because tier? she has nine hp and she has the heal ability if she doesn't if she doesn't get killed she survives whatever attack she gets she starts healing okay so can we talk about because you know also she gets, she gets more dice more dice attacking when she's attacking somebody with an objective so she's she's really good as long as your plan is not to win by points okay so in a kill team for example okay so definitely you know i was expecting her a little lower but i do agree with all your points i can put her i can put her in the b tier for sure because uh, i've seen her you know when you used her the the two or three times that you used her she was actually extremely powerful which is kind of like you know, not expected of this character because she can't hold objectives, so you would think she's kind of like counterintuitive to the whole point of the game, which is getting VP, but when you use her in a execute all the opponent's characters team, um, she becomes a lot more powerful, so I can agree with you on her being the, the in the B tier. For sure. Um, yeah. It just, feel, it just feels like once, once we realize that Characters are very squishy. They're flimsy, um, kind of like easy to get through. Um, characters that provide, you know, kill power became a lot more, like a lot higher uh, regarded in the tier list. So I agree where she's at. Low, lowest in the B tier, you know, highest in the C tier around that area. Um, yeah, she can she can roll a lot of dice against the the higher cost characters. Against characters that uh, that have objectives. Yeah. Okay, so in that way, Groot, where would you put him? Groot. Groot. I don't think I you have... were really high on him at first, at the very beginning. <laughs> no, I like I like him. I just the the move the moving small is it kills me. But I like everything else about him. Okay, so we'll put him in C, and actually we'll put him a little bit higher in the C tier, maybe right behind Venom. And the reason we're gonna do that is because of. He, you know, he is a very self-sufficient character in the sense that if he survives, he'll keep surviving over and over. So he is a tank. He is a tank in the quintessential sense, but he doesn't really do much else but hold a point, I guess. The key is pairing him with Rocket, um, which is coming up next. I think gives him a lot of value. So. And then using their card, which is overpowered. Oh yeah, their card. <laughs> their card is extremely powerful. That's for sure. So yeah, we'll definitely put him a little bit higher in the C tier than some of the other um, characters. Uh, Rocket, let's just... I'm going to save us all some grief and just put an A, maybe? Yeah, I concur. He is the only two drop that can kill three drops. And he could, he could kill some... some uh, he could kill like half the cast at four. Yeah. Maybe more. Maybe more. He's, he's strong for two costs. Two costs? That uh, so something that you can leave at home, uh, gaining points for you while dealing damage from five range, uh, costing two, and then his, he has a ridiculous damage output for a two cost piece. So just all those um, factors combined. I like to think about it as there's this interesting mini game that happens whenever you have Rocket in the game where the opponent actually just cannot ignore it. Like they have to actually send someone to inf infiltrate. Uh, the opponent's side of the board, just to try and get Rocket out of there because he, he he's just so influential in the damage output department. So that's why just being the only two cost that can kill three drops or higher is putting him in the A tier. Um, he can roll he can roll seven dice with uh with his second one. attack. Yeah, yeah Doctor Octopus can only go up to six dice. <laughs> So yeah, so and, and that's that's you know a two cost versus a three cost. <laughs> so I'm I'm actually gonna put him. I think he belongs over Proximal, but um, another one of your favorite pieces, Star Lord with the power so, gem. I think I think Star Lord is actually almost S tier. He he yeah. almost gets there. Yeah, I tried to convince you, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> so the reason why um, you believe he like, belongs in the S tier is because yeah, he's seven. Four range, seven dice every turn, at least once. Yeah, with the power gem. We should mention Star Lord with power gem is 
you know, the full combination of <laughs> the same way as Corvus with reality. Uh, Star Lord needs the power gem, but when he does have it, um, you know, seven dice plus uh, crowd control <laughs> abilities, uh, multiple of them. The only character with range attack that can a- apply multiple status conditions. Um, just all around a menace when he is allowed to do his thing. And uh, can you t- can we talk about the reroll ability? If he fails, he just goes again. So yeah. So he never he never blanks. He never he truly always, fails, right? <laughs> he always at least hits one. <laughs> yeah, and then not not to mention that, but also uh, the fact the fact that he's doing so much damage output um, for four cost. He's actually the most viable four cost in the whole game. Um, from what we've seen, so yeah, he definitely belongs in the A tier. Um, four range, uh, status conditions, the whole, the, the whole like, you know, almost team ability. Basically. Team yeah, ability. The only thing, the only thing is this. Oh yeah, and the team ability too. He's a, he's a team leader. So if you ever want to uh, have, you know, paired him with uh, it, with other guardians of the galaxy, you know, he gets just a little bit of another, you know, incentive on top of yeah. that. Sometimes you get into situations where, where a card becomes useless, so you can you can use it to give six dice to somebody, and that's obviously extremely powerful. So, um, the only weakness I would say is he he doesn't have um armor. He's kind of like he's kind of like a, a a ranged glass cannon in a sense, but he does have six HP on both sides, so it's actually kind of difficult to get rid of him, right? I believe I believe he's five HP on the second side. Oh, okay. So he's only 5 HP on the flip side. Um, still kind of like a threatening piece. Uh, six and five on on a range four piece. Kind of. Yeah, he's very. You know, he's very strong. He's very strong. Range four, range four, and uh, seven okay. dice every turn. It's really good. Yeah, I just think that that the, the the fact that he if he fails a roll, he can go again. Um, uh, with his, uh, I think it's called plucky attitude. I, I feel like that, you know, sets him apart from a lot of other pieces because. He doesn't have a situation where he just fails and dies, you know. We'll see that with other characters in the A tier too. Like um, we're getting to him soon, Ronan. Also, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But just characters that can, you know, not fail. Like uh, they almost have a fail safe uh, within their their uh, character itself. Um, they become kind of useful. It's kind of like their version of armor, kind of, where they're gonna have some sort of use during the entirety of the game. So. That's pretty good too. Um, let's go to Black Dwarf. Black Dwarf, you, you, we we said B. I think he's the highest of the team. I like I like him. He has fourteen HP, fourteen HP with armor and uh, and four four melee dice on defense. I think he's he's a great. Yeah, just, if, just based if, on his tankiness, not even not even taking into account his attacks, but his attacks are, his attacks are average. His attacks are average. He has a built-in he has a built-in uh, uh, energy sink with his increased two dice to his attack pool, so he can actually output some damage after he's taking he, after he's taken a little bit of damage. He can actually output it himself, so it's pretty good in that way. Um, he has something to do with his energy. He has a throw, if I'm not mistaken, and yeah, he has, he has a throw. And he then also, true. even even if he moves small, he's kind of immortal, so it doesn't matter that he moves small. He just keeps moving forever, and um, yeah, just having just having four melee defense on a guy with armor, um, kind of like where Captain America, I mean, not Captain America, uh, Iron Man, where Iron Man uh, sort of, you know, is so tanky against certain team compositions, he's also, if you're not prepared to deal him damage in different ways, uh, he can just tank the whole team by himself. So. He's super tanky. Yeah, for sure. And then, what do you think about... Uh, the next piece. I n- I didn't like him at all, but I know that you had a lot of success with some of the teams that you played me against. So, what do you think about? Um, I, think- I love I love Ebony Ma. He produces a lot of energy, has triple damage output, and he can play two really good gems. Yeah, so I think the gems. Um, about it. And he has the defensive ability. He's like all around. He's a very strong piece. Uh, can you talk about the defensive ability actually? Because I I know that that's the the most redeeming factor of him. That you can pay two to have, to have any uh, to roll six dice on any attack. Yeah. So whenever you want, you he's basically not dying, pretty much whenever you choose. And then also you can do at least twice, at least twice per per round. 
Yeah, exactly. And the fact that he has 7 HP means that he never gets burst damage. Even if he fails a roll, he'll survive, right? So. Yeah, he always survives at least one attack. But exactly. he doesn't get one. a lot of situations where you throw him out there and want me to focus him because you know that his front side is going to last a very a significant amount of time and you just want him to gain the energy. So he gains four energy per turn plus whatever damage he takes. And he has a way to use all that energy because his uh his four cost attack is savage. Eight dice and they don't gain energy, that attack is very savage. Yeah, he can throw he can throw an item large. He's he's great. He's great on both on offense and defense. You save him for last so that you so that you know that you don't need to use the defensive ability and then you, you can go ham with his attack abilities. Yeah. So as long as he's in the hands of a of an experienced player, he can you know, go to town. Um I would say the only reason that he's below Black Dwarf is Black Dwarf is a little more versatile in the sense that he could that you would only put Ebony Ma in a very specific set of teams, but Black Dwarf can go into any team that needs a tank. So I think he's a little more universal but there's, there's better attackers than uh, than Evonima, but there's not many many better tanks than than Black Dwarf. Agreed, agreed. That's a very good way of saying it. Um, okay, so with that, speaking of tanks, we go to the single uh, most cost efficient unit in the game, and uh, you know what we've seen so far, and I think it's... when it comes to tanking. Yeah. So at first, sing- I was completely blind to. Uh, Drax and what he brings to the table, but you kind of like enlighten me on just how good of a piece he is. So I could go on for hours on how broken Drax is, but I'll let uh, you go the, on. The main, re- the main reason that he's good is the value you get 12 HP with armor. On a tank is, cost. Absolutely crazy. It's the most value you're going to get for, for a tank. He has uh, three different attacks, uh, all, you know useful in certain situations all of them maybe which is the only detriment but you know he makes up for it by he can be in any situation and never die just because he's so huge for his cost um he has a throw which is very unique because it's a throw four so you can literally throw anybody he could throw the hulk if you wanted to uh so that's why that's why it's a titan titan killer um also one of his attacks throws two and it's based on how much damage he's tanked and obviously he's the tank so he's going to take damage uh, if the opponent, the opponent kind of like in a weird place where he can't be ignored because he deals so much damage, he can roll, you know, up to eight damage, uh, just on his own merit. And then that's on a guy with 12 HP and armor. So just an absurd piece. He's value town. If you want to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a, he's really efficient at what he does. So not much else to say about him. He's kind of just broken up there. Um, then Ronin. So a very recent discovery. Um, it took us a little bit of time to play him because we we're kind of like apprehensive about playing a five, uh, uh, you know, five cost because it's him with the power gem. Kind of apprehensive about him. Um, personally, I think that the reason why I didn't want to play him was because he is unreliable in the sense that his attacks, um, m- most of them say if this attack deals damage, then do X. So if he low rolls or the opponent high rolls or any combination of that, um, he doesn't actually execute his effects, and that can be like super detrimental. But because of the power gem, we kind of like started ignoring that, and uh, also his his passive ability when he dies. If you want to go more into that, uh, no, yeah, he's a uh, the power gem is what makes him good. If if power gem didn't exist, he would not be where we're gonna put him at. Yeah, so his, uh, I think it's called Cree, Cree Judgment, uh, the four cost attack. You can do it every single turn. And, Cree Justice. Yeah, you can do it every single turn, and that attack is just absurd. So <laughs> eight dice, eight dice. Uh, you need you need to land. You need to find a way to gain another energy. But yeah, it's four four energy to do the attack. You can do it. You can do it almost every turn as long as you deal at least one damage with the strike. Yeah, which is also very powerful because it's a throw strike. So his his melee attack is very powerful. His range attack is uh, very powerful. Um, has another effect. I think it's shock. So that's the second best status condition. Um, or his, range four shock. Yeah, range four shock. So it's very similar to Thor, but you know his access to the power gem 
you know, makes them extremely powerful. Uh, Cree Justice makes it so that you use your energy very efficiently every turn. Just an absurd amount of dice uh, with a really good wild effect. And the fact that his uh, when he dies, he gets to attack. So he almost so he will 100% always get two Cree Justices um, before he dies. Even even if he provides no other benefit and dies on the front side and the back side with doing nothing, he'll still attack twice with Cree Justice. So very powerful with field dressing. Oh yeah. Also, you can do you know multiple crew justice with field dressing. You know, he can very he can very realistically pay for um, cards because of the power gem. It's just in ge- the power gem actually. You know, talking a little bit about gems and where they fall into all of this. I think the power gem at first was one of the lowest uh, gems for us, but it became really really quickly like maybe the third most powerful gem uh, for us just from everything that we've seen. Just because of how powerful cards are and how the power gem can just pay for them whenever we want. So, yeah, the the characters that can only use power gems are very powerful with power gem. Yeah, exactly. Almost almost night and day difference between power gem and no power gem. So, yeah. um, okay, we're nearing the end, uh, but I think it's been pretty good so far. So, I'm just gonna put this guy right over here. Yeah. <laughs> He, he has an affiliation, so maybe he goes a little bit higher, but uh, we played this to him a couple of times. You had him on your side twice. I had him on my side like three times, and his his ability is just so difficult to execute just because the characters that you play with him don't really make energy, and his ability requires energy, so it's just kind it's of hard to balance. He's not worth, not worth playing. Yeah, he just doesn't do anything. The, the only reason I put him there in the C tier as opposed to the D tier where, where the unplayable characters are, um, honestly, because he does incinerate, and incinerate is a very unique uh, keyword. Um, it's actually extremely powerful, but the reason why it's not up there with Shock, for example, is because, you know, of the reason I just explained, on, only this character and I think Doctor Strange can do incinerate, so it's just... Oh, and... Uh, Ghost Rider Ghost. 2, yeah, but the keyword very powerful, the, the card, the, the uh, piece casting it, not very powerful, So and it's also very unreliable. Just too the many problems, he has power the problems, etc. He has, he has, I think it was 13 HP, and that's a, about like the only thing, the only good thing about him. Yeah, he's kind of hard to kill, and his backside is actually pretty strong, because he has the glider attack, um, he gets to throw himself uh, for 4 damage. So four automatic damage, but he's so easy to kill on the flip side that it's just not reliable for his class. He's twelve HP, sorry, twelve HP. Yeah, just not not great. I don't know, but um, yeah. So he's there in the C tier, and then here we get uh, personally my favorite piece. I think um, if not my favorite piece, my second favorite piece, uh, Doctor Strange. So. Also, so okay, we gotta go. We gotta explain a little bit about Doctor Strange uh, and why he belongs in the S tier. I think because he's he's kind of like one of the less intuitive, um, broken characters in the game. Um, I feel like the fact that he has a coin flip chance to uh, make someone have an activation token, and you can manipulate the variants in many different ways with many different characters, like Shuri, Baron Zemo, and cards like Recalibration Matrix. I feel like if you just hit, you just almost win immediately. So He, me, to me, he's like strictly an Avenger. He is S tier because of his, his, uh, his power level when combined with Captain America's minus one. Right, so let's go into that a little bit. Um, he has Hagot's uh, Wisdom, where he pays two and gives any character a plus two defense dice. Um, so obviously increasing dice pool, one of the most broken mechanics. But not only that, if you combine it with Captain America, uh, it only costs one. So every every other time a character gets attacked, you get to increase the dice pool. And obviously we don't really have to explain how broken that is, right? It it makes it so that they gain essentially one extra uh, defense, or you would say pseudo armor. You know, if you average it out, two dice is equal to one block, right? So 
you give everybody pseudo armor and all of a sudden characters that are slightly worse become crazy powerful right so not to mention he's a complete piece all on his own and he has access to two very powerful gems so the soul gem not very much powerful but the the time gem extremely powerful so the soul gem is the worst gem yeah. but if you only have one point then you know you give it to him yeah, if you only have access to one point, you give it to him just because the power generation is very good on him. Um, but he's very self-sufficient uh, in almost every way. And the time gen costs one with Captain America, so that's another. Just, the synergy points that you have with, with it, within that team are extremely powerful. So, And then the time walk is obviously <laughs> absurd. So, um, Where do you want to put Wong? I know that this is going to be a little bit of a controversial one. This, I say B. I say B because he, his only purpose is to heal uh, to heal characters and give energy to characters and maybe uh, contest contest uh, something on your side. But as soon as he gets into battle, he just dies. And he doesn't really do any damage to anybody, not even other two costs. Yeah, so in that way, I actually think that in point getting like go wide strategies where you have a lot of pieces on the table he's actually very powerful because he makes your less durable pieces actually real pieces you know um but the nature of the game is works in such a way where pieces get one shot a lot of the time um unless they're tanks and if they're tanks you kind of really don't want to be healing them unless like for a specific reason so i feel like he he's kind of like counterintuitive in uh, like against how the game works as a whole but he's definitely powerful when he gets to heal multiple times a turn and you know etc etc so maybe low b tier i think is where he belongs we'll just leave him there um let's oh we're, we're almost almost to the good stuff now <laughs> um Let's just do Romanov really quick. I don't think we would ever play Romanov. Did we ever? Uh, we played with her. We play tested with her twice, maybe. Did we both. Up, we both. Did you end up both. liking her or disliking her? How do you feel about? It? I feel. I feel. I felt she was fine. If you're playing for points, she's fine. This is nothing amazing. Nothing great. She's very average. Would you say she's unplayable though, or where would you? <laughs> No, she's not unplayable. We don't. We wouldn't put her on D. Okay. We'd where do you put want her on D situated? On C. I don't know where on C, but definitely not last. Winter Soldier is definitely last. So I would say that she's actually better than Killmonger and Venom, but worse than the Hulk. And the reasoning for that is that I really like her power generation, um, energy generation. Sorry, uh, her basic attack giving her two energy per turn and then that being reliable enough to deal one damage on average and then maybe two damage you know and that she the ability gains strictly one it only gains one but, no, always... no, but in terms of damage output you know sometimes she she deals consistent chip damage um if you can give her attack steroids in some way you know it becomes pretty powerful and just the fact that you gain an extra EVP at the end of the turn. The reason why we thought that she would be a lot more powerful at first and then she kind of like, you know, fizzled out a little bit was because other characters, kind of like Valkyrie, for example, you can you can just kill the opponent's piece and then get that same VP that, you, that she provides for you if, you know, a different character kills, you know, an opponent's piece and then she goes in and gets you a VP. It's kind of like she's redundant almost in a way because if you just kill the opponent's piece you get vp versus her it's like somebody else has to kill a vp and then she goes in so it's just it's just kind of like win more often and she can't even kill people on her own right because her attacks are not that strong they require a lot of synergy to deal damage so she's just there to play cards yeah, I, I agree. I think I think her energy generation is the best part about her. Um, her range is kind of decent, and overall, not enough redeeming factors to make her playable. What do you think about uh, one of my favorite pieces? This was the single my single favorite piece on day one, and still continues to be very high on my list. Uh, but I like him a little bit less now. But what do you think about him, Hawkeye? Hawkeye, he is definitely a tier. Yeah, I agree with you. 
I think for, he, the, for the same reasons he's he's a, a a better rocket. Yeah, if you had the extra one threat to use, I think he just strictly replaces rocket, and then you're good to go in all those scenarios. Then he has he has he has he adds the the keywords the special conditions. Yeah, so um, same damage yeah. output, same range, but add special conditions, and he has the blink effect, which very few characters have. So. And they core cover. It's basically they're basically the same. They both do five range, five dice, but but Hawk guys can add a lot more when needed. Yeah, agreed. Status conditions like slow versus some uh, team compositions, shock versus most people. Just yeah. like, Everything and he, cho for him. he chooses. He chooses whether it's a uh, melee or energy damage. Yeah, which can have some applications. Uh, just powerful leave. in general. Yeah. And like like the difference between five range and four range honestly cannot be understated. I think five range is just so powerful that you know e even if he had like other detriments to him, like the fact that he's a glass jaw, like he doesn't really survive very easily. But with proper positioning, I think he can be a menace. So the five range is definitely what makes him so broken with the blink. An eight range uh, zone of influence is just so ridiculously powerful. So um, Eight range attack twice, because anybody can move, and like Rocket could move and, and hit somebody within eight. Oh, that's a that's a really good thing to point out. Yeah, no, it's it's not just a range. Is is the blink doesn't take up his movement action, so he can attack twice. So that's very very key compared to other characters. Anybody can move and shoot, but not everybody can move and double shoot. <laughs> so, and then before we get to the best piece uh, of this game, and kind of like very difficult to dethrone this piece, we'll we'll talk about these two. Um, how do you feel about these two? I have not been able to play with them, so I have no opinion. And but, but at the same time, I have not been able to think of where I would want to use them or how I would want to use them because their abilities are weird. And they can drop objectives, but I don't know. I don't know how useful that is. Right. So it's very unintuitive to put them anywhere. I think that the main reason we haven't used them is not for lack of wanting to. Um, they're definitely cool pieces. Um, this and things like that. It's just, it's sort of difficult to visualize a scenario where either of them would be better than other three cost pieces. I know that Wasp, if I had to mention anything, I know that Wasp is significantly more powerful than Ant-Man, um, I feel, but for the most part, you know, being able to drop objectives powerful, um, maybe? Question mark? Uh, I don't even know what I want to pair them with. Exactly. That's another thing too. Where would they belong? Like, who who would they belong with? Um, they, they don't even belong, you know, in Avengers. They're, they're not that efficient in Avengers um, for what they provide. So they're just kind of like hard to slot in. Anyway, I th honestly, the more that I that I read their um, character cards, I feel like they were just thrown in there for the fan service and not particularly for any sort of like power level consideration. But that's just me. So. I'm just going to leave them in the D tier because they're just kind of like undiscovered and at least on the surface they seem pretty useless. So, Okay, so we're down to uh, some of the most powerful uh, characters in the game, uh, saving the best for last, obviously. So we're going to go with Ghost Rider first, and we just very recently put Ghost Rider all the way from... I think top of C, low B to A tier. Um, you know, the highest A tier, if not... I think I'm actually going to put him in low S tier, if I'm being honest with you. Um, <laughs> I want to see I want to see how much different this, this list is from the one we made before. Right, yeah. I think um, the one that we started with, like, uh, in, you know, in the rehearsals, <laughs> I think uh, Ghost Rider was, like, B tier. Um... I know that I know that Ronan was like C maybe I don't remember I, I don't even know why I had put him so low on the tier list Ebony Ma uh, we had a, a a long back and forth between you know where he belongs I just know that our rough draft of this list doesn't look anywhere near what this one looks like <laughs> so I'm very I glad see, because you know, I see uh, Ghost Rider goes into the A tier because he's he's not broken 
Yeah, so based on our description of the of the tier list, um... he, was, he was he was really good, but then the card the the card that makes him that lets you trade somebody else for 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 him makes him really broken. So maybe he does belong in, in S, but, but I I want to see it in action before I, before I commit to saying that he's S tier. Yeah, so we played him a lot actually. We played him maybe four games. Um, I was a really. I was a really huge fan of Ghost Rider at first because I thought that he counters um, Thanos, which we're about to uh, look into right now because um, just of, like how his kit works, how he interacts with Thanos, how he interacts with a reality gem, like everything that he does kind of does counter like those the two, the two best characters in the game. But at the same time, that's not really the reason you play him. You play him for his five cost attack that almost execute someone and gives him zero energy and then the his card that uh, revives him and those two factors really propelled them up to the a tier uh, the card? Not to mention he gives incinerate which is pretty powerful yeah he's uh his his blue ma- blue attack the five dice attack it's a five uh, cost uh is it eight dice, seven dice? I don't remember actually. Oh no, it's, it's five dice. It's five dice, and you can give them any amount equal to the energy the opponent has, right? Yeah, it's up to five. it's five dice plus whatever energy they have, and then whatever damage you deal, they lose that energy instead of gaining. Yeah, yeah. So it's not even that they don't gain; is that they lose also. Yeah. So even someone who's ramped up, uh, so that um, attack is overpowered. <laughs> it's very overpowered. Yes. The, and then when you combine it with uh, with his card of him coming back to uh, to full HP and sacrificing another character and giving incinerate to everybody around him. Yeah, but that, you sh- usually that's not gonna happen. Do you want to like give like your Wong or your Rocket back and they, and then they stay healthy? Yeah, it's pretty unreliable. And, yeah. and then you trade with, then you trade with them. They're, you're not gonna deal any damage, but you get a healthy a healthy Ghost Rider back. Yeah, you literally trade your two piece. I mean, your two point uh, Wong or the rocket that's already like wreaked habit uh, all over the opponent's uh, team. You just like replace them, and then you have a whole five cost character all over again. Like With, without the activation token. Oh yeah, good to mention. Uh, he comes back, and you get to use him again, <laughs> which is obviously absurd. Like it, the card, the card is everything for this character, and. You know, that's why he got propelled up so many tiers. And I think, I honestly think he's very close to S tier, if not S tier already, just because of those interactions. But we'll leave him there for now. And then. The car probably makes him S tier. You know what? This is a one time thing. We're just going to throw him up there. Just <laughs> for the rest of the time, he'll be up there riding his bike and doing his thing. And then, no. obviously, if there was if there was an S plus tier. I think that these two characters belong in S plus, honestly. Um, so we just have them on the on the very top. They're the strongest of the S tiers. Thanos has the, the has the biggest damage output in the game, and Corbius the second biggest. But he does it at a much cheaper price. You would say that these two are interchangeable within the S plus tier. Like I think that. Thanos definitely needs to be built around um, in the sense that he costs so much that you have to be very selective of the pieces that you put around them. But he just uh, buffs uh, those pieces so heavily that you know he can make useless characters useful and he can make broken characters even more broken. Um, but also his own like utility is so high in the fact that he has access to the time gem. It costs zero, so it's very self-sufficient and... Every auto, every auto attack is a throw, um, you know, pretty reasonable. Uh, with the reality gem on top of that, um, I don't know. Just everything about him is just crazy, right? Like it's just crazy. Yeah, the 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 time reality pair makes him really strong. You you can kill two, maybe sometimes three characters or daze them in one activation. And that's just him. Not to mention that he makes his other character, like for example. Um, we were talking about this earlier where Thanos uh, Thanos's best piece is Rocket because Rocket um, is a very low cost piece with a very high damage output and Thanos makes it even higher damage output. His basic attack becomes a 7 uh, dice on a 2 drop. That is absurd, right? So they're kind of like partners in crime in that way because Thanos really needs cheap characters to go with him because he costs so much. 
So, but he's yeah. the best character in the game by far. I think. And then he can he can move characters around. He can he can pump. What, he can, can, what can he not do? I'm pretty sure he does everything and then some. Honestly, the only thing he, the only thing he can do is heal. Yeah, heal. I'm sure, but I'm sure that, I'm sure they'll come up with a gem that lets you heal. They should have. <laughs> made, they should have made the soul the soul gem heal some sort. He revives of, himself. <laughs> <laughs> if he has a soul gem, he comes back once per game or something. That would be hilarious, but no, yeah, just everything that he provides is absurd. So he's gonna he's gonna stay as the best character in the game, and then this uh, box of characters is at least better than Winter Soldier. So we'll put it over here. Hilarious. <laughs> so I think that this is it. Um, I want to thank you, Milton, for playtesting this game with me uh, for such a long time. We have more than 100 hours on it right now, and it's been a pretty good experience. I can't wait for, you know, hopefully tournaments in the future to happen. Uh, I'm sure that online will continue, the community will continue to grow and everything. Um, this tier list was very fun to make. Uh, we came up with, I think, a, a you know, pretty acceptable tier list between the two of us, and, you know, I really enjoyed the process, so... Um, Thank you to everybody who stayed to watch the tier list um, this far. Um, this is your Marvel cool. Crisis Protocol tier list as of uh, right now, uh, September 2020. So um, thank you everybody for watching and have a good one.